Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 18th day of the New Earth Summit. Now in its third year, India's first integrative summit on solutions to our problems in health, food, farming, and environment. I'm Sophie Sequera from Earthkeepers Goa, your host for this evening. And I extend a warm welcome to our topic presenter, Daryl D'Souza, also on behalf of our 10 Earthkeeper groups in India and overseas. We express our gratitude to you all for taking time out to be with us this evening and to share your insights and experiences so that all watching this live webinar and its recording later may benefit from the holistic science and wisdom being presented on this platform, which will help us all co-create a beautiful world. So our topic for today is life, food, health, homes, products, education, and currency by plants. Um, I'll introduce you to Daryl D'Souza, who has been teaching people how to reverse chronic illnesses with integrated natural therapies for over 16 years. After his own suffering of 14 years due to chronic illnesses that almost ended his life in 2004 due to modern medicine failing him. His book, Become Healthy or Extinct, and his lectures, seminars, webinars, workshops, and residential retreats on the healing of mind, body, and spirit are highly sought out. Daryl was the secretary of the World United Doctors and Healers Association for five years, during which he curated and convened their annual continued medical spiritual education conferences. Daryl is also an industrial engineer, organic farmer, environmentalist, TEDx speaker, founder of Earth, Keep Earth Keepers Connect, ambassador of Vegan Nation, convener of the New Earth Summit, and a speaker at the World Parliament on Spirituality. For over 20 years, Daryl has been researching soil, plant, animal, and human biology marine biology, planetary ecology, and holistic living as well, which has inspired him to launch the New Earth Summit as a platform to showcase their integrated and symbiotic functioning. His work is detailed on DarylDeSouza.com. So for the first hour of this webinar, Daryl will be making a very interesting presentation on today's topic. And then we will open up for question and answers with our audience at 7 p.m. Who can type in their questions in the Q&A box below even before that time. If you would like to receive the recorded video of this webinar or you want to share it with others, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The New Earth Summit. Daryl, could you please go ahead with the presentation? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sophie, and good evening to everyone. I uh, will be making a presentation that has got uh, some nice pictures to illustrate uh, what I want to explain about how important plants are and uh, the basis of you know uh, this whole work, uh, what I call the free economy or plant economy. Okay, so what is in front of you are chairs and on the left hand side, there are chairs that are made of iron. And we have these in our homes and on the right hand side, you can see chairs that are made of wood. Now, of course, the first uh, wooden chair is a bamboo chair and the next one probably of teak. So from where, how do these chairs come to us? Uh, through what process? What is the source? So on the left hand side, you can see a factory that's, you know, melting iron. Of course, uh, uh, before that, uh, there is mining that happens. So to get these chairs, you have to create an entire industry. And you can see the railings there and the roofing there and even the big melting pot, the furnace, you know, the, the transfer uh, uh, vessel. 
even that is made out of metal but on the right hand side you can see a workshop from where the chair is made now most of what you can see in the workshop on the right hand side is wood and probably even the pillars you know the framing the walls of wood probably even the roof is of wood so now all of that iron the machines the factory everything it comes from making holes in the earth by mining and that is so by going down and making holes and boring deeper and deeper and creating uh, all of these uh, craters but on the right hand side you can see that uh, nature is bringing up to us and offering us the resource of wood so looking at uh, the chairs again on the left hand side now this iron chair for how long is it going to last the one on the left i have some in my backyard they rusted in about 5 years then the next one uh, next to it is probably a little bit of cast iron uh yeah so these chairs iron chairs are probably going to last you what 30 40 50 years 60 100 years 120 and the chairs on the right hand side let me talk about the teak chairs i have got teak chairs in my house i am uh, sitting on one right now that is over 100 years old now even if those iron chairs if they get corroded after some time 100 or 200 years then that is lost forever you have to go mining and make more holes in the earth to get a new chair but on the right hand side you could just be growing another teak tree in 30 years you know it would grow so tall that uh, it could make you four five chairs at least so what i'm trying to say over here is on the left hand side we had non renewable resource on the right hand side we have a renewable resource that we can renew at the pace that we want in the location that we want of course we first go to forest and cut them down and you know exploit them but if you have your own land you can plan for your building materials and many things like you can see in that carpentry shop are made of wood so it turns out that making a wooden chair and even if this wooden chair it lasts for 100 years or 200 years right after two within 200 years you would have so many trees growing that could make you many more chairs so you have a uh, excess supply then what your demand is if you will choose to grow trees continuously or wherever possible so by this picture i just want to illustrate that uh, we have two routes one is making our products from all non renewable resources that are damaging the planet and also creating those factories that start using up all those materials and make holes in the earth on the right hand side we have plants that can do at least you know things like this so plant is a renewable resource and even if you go on a land and there are less plants you can increase that renewable resource and become more prosperous on the land and this can go on for thousands and thousands of years now the second aspect we know that yes plants are our food as well and plants are the only things on this planet that make food animals do not make food they eat plants that are their food so we have the vegetarian animal eating plants and then we have the non vegetarian animal eating the vegetarian animal same thing happens in the marine kingdom as well now we have to understand about life on this planet and where we came in and what uh, you know role that plants play in our life 
so obviously human beings could not live on this planet till the time some range of plant based food was available so if we just had grasses whenever this time of evolution on this planet uh if there were only grasses and we all know progression you know as uh, time goes forward uh structures and uh, plants also become more and more complex they change over time over the weather pattern so at a time where there were very few and small plants and there were no fruiting trees for example human beings could not exist on this planet so all of the different plant materials whether it's you know like the broccoli i think is growing and lettuce and then there are some fruiting trees in the background and probably some grains that have been harvested on the left hand side um so our um, entire range of food that comes from plants uh, they bring to us daily our nourishment and uh, it is literally that all of our body right our physical vehicle are created by plants because if you don't if you stop you know eating this uh, food you will dry up and die of course so in effect uh, human beings are the products of plants just think about it we can also be called the produce of the children of plants and if not for plants and if not for their capacity of bringing together the five elements to make food and to grow themselves right so you have the five elements of earth water fire air space where earth and water come from mother earth fire which is the sun element that makes the plants you know capable of photosynthesis and creating their body and all the produce that's the fire element then the space element is of course all everything around which i call father sky and uh, then the air element is a combination of father sky and mother earth uh the gases so it's literally plants are the only species on this planet that take together the finer elements and produce food so that is the point that i wanted to make about life uh, and how uh, intricately we are connected and our life depends on plants and they don't do their work of course we will perish of course if the sun also stops shining then the plants don't get to do their work and then we will starve as well so from life to food and all the food that we eat on a daily basis that gives us our nutrients that goes into our blood that makes the blood cerebral spinal fluid all our hormonal secretions from our endocrine glands and uh, through those uh, secretions we experience the uh, you know uh, our life our attitudes and all of these amazing hormones whether it is you know dopamine or serotonin or uh, uh, melatonin right uh, all of our creativity our capacity of creativity when i when i uh, i'm teaching people about you know uh, having capacity of creativity i always tell them to eat a good range of fruits because they have got the natural sugars along with their minerals vitamins fiber and all of that that gives human being the capacity and entire range of whatever we can do physically mentally and emotionally as well so uh, going further from food the next is uh, medicine so much of medicine is created from herbs from flowers like aromatherapy uh, even i use herbal teas as medicines and of course uh, many ayurvedic herbs or chinese herbs that are used in medicine so for medicine we have two aspects of plant one is what hippocrates said let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food so it turns out that 70% of your chronic illnesses like high bp cholesterol diabetes and all of that uh can be reversed if you eat 
the right kind of healthy foods in the right you know season and uh, if they are uh, local and uh, organic or natural so most of health comes from there but when we make mistakes in that area then we have to rely on herbs for healing so plants give us our medicine for good health as well then the next is uh, from plants we can make our home homes like these of course uh, if you are doing it on the land for the foundation you will need stone which is of course on the surface of the land and you will need mud you will need lime or whatever natural uh, you know dyes and colors that you want to use from plants also and uh, your entire home a natural home can be built by stone mud wood and other plant material so as we go through this and progress uh, in this presentation i just want you to keep at the back of your mind when we open up for q and a what are the things that you will not get if you are in a community like this from plant and let's see if the the list is a short one or a long one because we always want to have a you know comfortable life so let's look at what are the things we want in our daily lives and how they can come about and whether plants can do everything so here are just uh, some products of one plant which you can make out is the bamboo and uh, there are literally over 100 products that can be made from bamboo you know even uh, like those drinking cups drinking water bottles and so many of course the chair that you saw basket casket this is a very small range that is in front of you then uh, it is said that there are about 120 products that can come just from the coconut tree and of course they are in coastal places but they can be manufactured as a local cottage industry in coastal places and sold all over the country uh at the bottom on the right hand side uh, i have uh, uh two bowls made of uh, coconut shell big coconut shells i also have a wine goblet made of coconut shell so uh, really amazing range then here you have the palm or arika nut leaf uh, products cutlery and spoons and cups plates that i've been using you know for all of my uh, different uh, meetings where people come to we sell all of this at the organic market then here is a wonderful uh, tree which is the hemp and you can see the list of things that can be made from hemp uh, i have a backpack i had shoes uh, so you can even make bricks from hemp by uh, fabric cotton kind of hemp cotton and uh, body care products building materials yeah food so those were just uh, three four of those plants and of course we have thousands of plants that we can make things of now all of this uh, knowledge right when you do something like an eco village or eco community it can come in by the people who come to build the community and that's what you know i'm working at in goa right now so once you have enough number of people with the right kind of skill sets then you have all the knowledge in house you really do not need to go on to the internet or have computers uh, at your place to google up this and that um, people would have already done that uh, the reason why we have to do that now is because we had forgotten the community living model earlier where knowledge was passed down from generation to generation for that locality which was a great expertise for that locality what the building materials the food the natural products uh what we call you know in an asset based community development model for goa 
cannot be the same as what you use in Cairo, in Egypt, because of all the materials over there will be different. So, uh, so the starting point is all of this knowledge uh, we need to gather and uh, bring people together to start making this eco village. And uh, the reason I, meant, I mentioned the computer was because the design of eco village that I have done, we don't need computers to run that place at all. Um, I mean, uh, we have, we will be having few of them, which are, which is in our knowledge center and our education center. But uh, life is designed in such a way that everybody doesn't need a laptop or a computer, because the reflection is from where do the materials that build uh, those machines, from where do they come? Again, they come from mining, from extruding, uh, taking out crude oil to make all the plastics and all of that. So that uh, kind of model is the one that has brought this entire world to a state where these non-renewable resources are getting over in the next 15, 20, 25 years. And if we do not think very clearly in the direction of how can we have life, build homes, and have all our products and services without taking any non-renewable resources from the earth. If we do not start not only thinking and working at it, there are communities across the globe who are doing it, but the number needs to increase. If we don't do it now, then we have no future beyond 25, 30 years. So what I'm presenting now is uh, principles and models and ideas that will uh, stop all of that extraction and use things that are renewable on the surface of the earth. So lesser time and energy spent getting into the earth, you know, creating all of those machines and earth movers is also coming from a lot of mind. So this model, what I'm talking about, will take us to the next 25,000 years as compared to 25 years right now. So now we'll see how we can make that place comfortable. And uh, in the Q&A round, you can ask me all of those questions of your basic uh, needs and uh, other you know, priorities in life for your daily requirements. So the education also to build a community like this is very different from the education that we have all been getting from the great universities across the globe that have manifested this world that is going to collapse in the next 25 years. And uh, uh, the education, this kind of community is very different. It is something, if any of you have heard of the Waldorf education or the Steiner model, uh, it's an experience-based learning model. And this picture that you see here is something like that where people learn in a live environment because nature itself is a laboratory and a teacher. So children uh, learn more through mimicry. And that's the biggest mistake we're making, putting them in closed classrooms and basically showing them pictures and textbooks of leaves, you know, whether when they could really experience and touch and feel, you know, uh, experience every leaf and every plant around them. So instead we teach them mathematics and that's not a skill that uh, starts developing innately in the human body at the age of four. Uh, all species on this planet and including human beings, we learn through mimicry. So you will see that uh, at the ages of three, four, five, children will learn a lot of things through mimicry in an open school with the real material. So typically from uh, by the age of 15, children in such environment, they know how to uh, grow plants, how to grow food, how to make food, how to use natural building materials, how to even make a natural home, and all the basic things in life that you will see that the indigenous people, you know, uh, have been working at. Maybe making uh, musical instruments and all will come a little later. But by the age of 15, uh, by the age of 18, uh, such children will come out as ready for life with professional skills to start earning a living. Isn't this much better than what we are doing right now, where children uh, can come out only at 22, 23 years of uh, age 
and most of us who have been in this system you know uh, many of us i would say not most like for myself like an engineer i've completely quit that field and i'm doing something uh, closer to life uh, right now so this education system and what i call so in this uh, picture also it's not of i go village in goa i just took it off the internet so there's somewhere on the right hand side you can see some structures and maybe that's an education center so in places like this the real education about the source of life the flow of life the flow of nutrients uh, understanding about water understanding about uh, forests understanding about how to keep the five elements in their purity because in an, in the environment like this you see earth water fire air space all in their natural element and that was a talk that i gave at the third world parliament on spirituality uh dharma and the earth keepers where human beings are the only species on this planet who have violated their dharma which is their basic duty which all other species on the planet are doing and what is that uh they use the five elements in their purity and they never contaminated or changed their form and they had life through it so their food and all of that you have, you know took in the air oxygen gave out carbon dioxide but that is balanced in nature by trees but uh, human beings are the only ones who uh, took the air put it in automobiles and you know put out smoke and uh, took the water contaminated it uh, made effluents out of it for so many products and all of this contamination of these elements is happening to produce goods and services uh, that are actually not required for a uh, good and healthy life so when you live in an environment like this that's the only time you will learn real products and services and how to keep nature as it is and how to let it flow naturally now in spaces like this you know uh, where I, it's written on top sacred herbs now i had started having amazing experiences uh, with sacred herbs since uh, 2015 and there are certain range of plants that uh, when you have them they take you into deeper states of awareness where you start getting very deep uh, lessons your your energy body expands your mind expands and you they start teaching you things of uh, the plant kingdom and that's basically where i got my you know deeper experiences of how uh, all of these nutrients uh, flow from the plants i saw all of these things visually of course now when i'm uh, presenting it to you on uh, uh, you know this presentation it's easy to understand and you know the logic that uh, plants have created us and i go to the extent uh, of saying that plants are the biggest hand of god on this planet if we say god is the creator then scientifically we can prove this that plants are the biggest active daily acting hand of god on this planet because they create food it's from them that all of us all insects critters snails snakes reptiles all have life so now all of this you know deeper understanding uh i got from uh plant medicine and uh of course uh i also uh since i am in the field of spirituality uh and i've written my book in become healthier extinct which is mainly a book on health i have explained how the human body and the human energy bodies what you call the chakras how they go into each goes into maturity every 7 years and uh, that's why you have puberty happening at the age of 14 because that's from your root chakra uh, that's the first one then you go to your next uh, center which is your sexual chakra and that matures at the age of 14 and that's why you have puberty happening at that time and then in another sen- uh, seven years you have your sense of self or your character uh, building completely and that's happening in the area of your solar plexus 
Then in another seven years, you have the full maturity of your heart center. Next seven years, your, your communication center, which is your throat center. The next seven years, it goes into your third eye or the wider wisdom and the deeper you know, insight you get from life. And at the age of 49, your crown uh, center, that is your God connector, your spiritual center gets matured. So this is a very detailed science. Uh, those of you who are interested in understanding the human uh, body, mind and spirit very deeply, please read that chapter of metaphysics in my book. And then uh, further on it, uh, I will be, I'm writing a book on spirituality that will come out next year. So what I wanted to share was in ancient India or many places across the world, the position of a teacher would be given to somebody only who had crossed these 49 or 50 years. Because you have seven energy centers into seven years, uh, it takes you about 49 years, 50 years. Uh, and only those people who had all the energy centers, that means whenever, whenever you speak your communication, that means you have a deeper insight of what you're saying and that the spiritual, you know, the God connect, but the spiritual wisdom is also there in the words that you speak. So, um, so this, you know, as uh, people grow up and they reach this age, it's a good time to start using uh, plants, those plants which are called teachers, uh, to give you deeper wisdom. Of course, some people are in, uh, in need of lessons much earlier in life. So definitely they can use plant medicine to, you know, get that understanding. And you would have heard of these plant medicines. One of them is ayahuasca, that I had uh, all of my plant medicine uh, journeys. Uh, they were very educative and uh, uh, taught me a lot of things of the structure of nature, the flow of life, the, what I call the living sciences. Uh, then uh, I also uh, had uh, experiences with cannabis and also with uh, mushrooms and also with something that's called peyote. So I have used all of those uh, plant medicines uh, as learning tools. Uh, and uh, what happens is uh, some people when they are younger and they try to use this, uh, because of the profound experiences that they have, they uh, are not able to, you know, understand them. And uh, many of those experiences are so beautiful that they take them to what's called a high. And the trouble is that once you reach a high and the high comes down, because all plant materials that is taken, it will have its effect for some time. And then the effect goes down, uh, even with the food or your nutrients. So uh, when the high comes down, that's when they are, if they are in a life that is stressed, uh, that has money problems, that has, you know, self-doubt, that has relationship problems, then they feel that they are in a, you know, they are in back to hell. And that becomes the point of addiction, where you want to, ex uh, you know, escape hell and be in that beautiful place that you, uh, very deep spiritual expansive experience space uh, that you know uh, plant medicine and the teacher plants give you the sacred plants and that how somewhere uh, somewhere in the world has got into addiction but uh, we need to understand uh, that uh, uh, plants are very powerful if they have given us life you know when we mess up with them and we create uh, genetically modified seeds or we take natural uh, food uh, that should be fresh every day and we make it into processed foods, uh, then it contaminates uh, our, our body, it brings in toxins, it disturbs our digestive system, it creates sickness. So plants do what they do. We have to learn the real life sciences of how to use them well. So they can give life and they can take life away too with sickness if you don't use them well. So. Um, this is a part of education that is taught in all the indigenous communities across the world. And because they got these very deep lessons from plants, that's why they respect plants to such a degree. And such kind of teachings have not been given in universities across the globe till date. And that is why this world is in such a sorry state. So 
what is taught here over a century has manifested this world this artificial world where you see no nature you can learn nothing from here you can only learn what comes to you on the tv on the radio and the books manufactured by these universities that created this world where you know you're not having any of the five natural elements on a daily basis you're eating foods that that's poisoning you you are uh, living with stress uh, and it's a complete control system now all that has come up from the earth like this through concrete and metal and you know bars and reinforcements uh, they've all come at the price of making holes in the earth so this is the kind of uh, education we get in our so called universities across the globe and i hope some of them are you know going and learning more about natural life uh, and living system and changing their curriculum but it already seems that it's too late so people like us who believe uh, and know that we have the right living sciences and we have the right principles we should start creating our own you know institutions and own spaces but always in nature because nature is the real teacher and uh, plants uh, are the the greatest teachers from whatever i have experienced in my journey now this is the same model that as you know uh, created cities in one place and then uh, to feed that uh, you know population they have done the banking of rivers and created dams and stopped the stop the flow of water down uh, you know into the villages and so many villages thousands of villages on this planet where people were living naturally uh, because we always live people uh, they are always civilizations they need water on a daily basis so all of this uh, dam culture that has stopped the water dried up the rivers has also killed so many river based civilizations all across the planet and uh, the other problem is this that they've contained people in these concrete jungles at one place then they have to produce their food at another place far away and that gives uh, rise to this what we presented yesterday the food supply chain which even my co-host rahul goswami says there should not have been any food supply chain we should have been living in a place where food is grown probably half an hour one hour uh, you know from our thing and it should have come on a daily basis so just to get something that villagers get and i get in my home now because i grow uh, food uh, around my house um the day doesn't take you know 15 minutes to come from the garden and be in the kitchen um but now that is replaced with all of this material in between so all the ships trains planes factories you know all of them come from making holes here so the city based model keeping us away from our food has so you know and many other things now the next uh, slide is about this uh, because this food has to transit a long distance all the packaging and you know processing and the preservatives and the stabilizers which make us sick as compared to fresh food that we could have got in the locality if we had planned it well which was the earlier system uh, but then we had capitalists come in and make this entire system of control where they want to control our food our uh, building materials all the machines that are so unnecessary uh, because you know things have been decentralized i mean because things have been centralized sorry so like i explained all of these uh, food uh, uh, formats also for the packaging materials they use up all the resources from the earth again plundering it and that is why you have no access to medicine around your home and they have can taken control of our entire medicine system also and basically giving us fake medicine which does not cure anything like all of you know now the vaccine does not prevent you from getting uh, covid it does not cure your covid it does not prevent you from transmitting covid and yet it doesn't prevent you from dying also from covid so many natural uh, systems like ayurveda or nature cure or homeopathy 
or integrative natural medicine are actually taking care and curing people of COVID. So we have to understand that things have gone too far uh, with these uh, industries and with unnatural sciences and unnatural products. And yes, this is the further uh, result of all these companies manufacturing all these things uh, and all the transportation, you know, the manufacturing companies, they are putting effluents in the ground and smoke in the air and also, you know, creating unhealthy environments for us to live in. On the left hand side is all the food packaging and transport industry. All of these vehicles, they come out from holes in the earth. And the right hand side, they're separating people and their food growing places because people get jobs at places where food is made and food is served. So also they get jobs uh, where all, you know, manufacturing of things are done. So everybody is traveling so much, so far, and all of these vehicles are coming, each of them, and even the petrol that feeds them is coming with a cost to the earth. And that's why we don't have more than 25 years uh, that we can have, you know, the stabilization can go ahead because of the lack of resources. So it's only now that we are understanding that the indigenous people who were the real earth keepers, meaning they kept the earth the way it was and they could sustain for 10,000 years. And here we come with all our modern uh, hopeless sciences and we've ruined it just within 200 years. And it's only after our mistakes and we are choking on our air and we are dying of all these uh, unnatural medicines and we are leading stressful lives and the money is also, uh, even after working, we are all remaining poor and the Indian farmers are you know, committing suicide from debt. So we have to understand that uh, all of this has happened because of unnatural systems and unnatural products. And this uh, city model that has crawled so much damage to the planet. So coming back to community, whatever you want to design now, this is a picture I just took. It looks a bit congested in the middle, but yeah, the way I've designed the eco-village for Goa, things are a little bit spread out. But in this space, you can have a complete life with your manufacturing centers for natural products and your education centers, your arts and culture, your food growing centers, your eating centers. And uh, it can be designed in a very natural way. Now here are some calculations that I presented in a previous uh, webinar, but just repeating it for those of you today who are new to it. And uh, it is calculations about a certain size of an eco community that does not even require uh, any vehicles because you know that vehicles also come, the metal and the tires and all of that come from holes in the earth. Okay, so I'm going to relate everything uh, to holes in the earth. And when I say holes in the earth, meaning I'm talking of things that are non renewable. So please let us stop this entire destruction of the planet and look every day on what we're consuming from morning to night and what it is costing the earth. Because if we don't do that now, we have really no future and we have to change those habits or those choices. So here is a uh, simple thing. Actually, a person can walk six to seven kilometers in an hour. And we are all doing this in our gyms, unfortunately, half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening. But we can do it naturally, walking in nature, you know, socializing and talking to people on the way and um, interacting with so many things in our environment. So uh, one edge, like the length is, for example, uh, five kilometers, the breadth is five kilometers, and then you get 25 square kilometers. Kilometer. Meaning that uh, just to get you from there to any other point in the eco community, whether it is to work, your recreation center, to your food place, or you know, uh, any other utilities that you need to bring some you know, products and all of that, uh, it would take you, of course, you would not be living at one end. And the design is such that uh, uh, housing is done in such a way that uh, 
lot of the other facilities are around the place. So uh, walking less than uh, five kilometers, you could get anywhere. Maybe it's just one kilometer and it's you know probably going to take you 15 minutes. So this model is based on that. Uh, and we can have so many uh, villages like this uh, that are self-sufficient and having everything that they need. Okay, so a self-sustained uh, village for all uh, regular needs. So I've just put in cycles or tricycles for some people who think that they need it, but we also should understand, yes, it is also causing holes in the earth. So you can still do with walking. And then I just kind of put tricycles there because we will have youngsters, we will have senior citizens who cannot walk. So yes, for them at least we could do this. So it works out to 600 and uh, I mean 6,177 acres. Um, this model can be done even in a smaller place like 1,000 acres, which is what we're trying to do with the eco village in Goa. But this is to cater to a larger number of people. And a very nice model with villas that is no multi story building. So you don't need concrete and you don't need metal and all of that. In fact, uh, in our eco village, you don't even need glass for the windows. Uh, we are going to be making uh, window grills. Uh, so that you know animals and all don't come in of uh, wood carved you know beautifully carved artisan carved wood that is about one centimeter thick and for the mosquitoes uh, uh, we are going to be using uh, cotton weaved mosquito net instead of any plastic or aluminium that I have been using here in Goa so yes you can do windows uh, and be free of mosquitoes um, without glass so a uh, four bedroom villa, this is just a model for uh, eight people, uh, like uh, for one family, two parents, let's say two children and four grandparents uh, within a 500 square meters plot. And so every house, uh, this built up area of this uh, four bedroom villa takes about 200 square meters. So you've got 300 square meters around for your pets and your animals, making a small garden, parking your vehicles, and everything like that. Now, just talking about the land that you're living on, this villa plus that, uh, if you divide it by eight people, it's about just 63 square meters per person. And with adding another 437 square meters, that is uh, the amount of, you know, uh, farmland that would be used to, you know, produce food for you as an individual. Uh, you would be accessing public area, the water, common water body, whether it's a lake or it's groundwater, uh, then, uh, you know, all the common spaces. So that's a portion to each person. So overall, each person, you know, is engaging about 500 square meters. And so if you look at uh, the entire 25 square kilometers, very comfortably just with ground level villas, which I had explained in earlier in the health program, why are these uh, ground floor villas without air conditioning with natural ventilation where walking bare feet you get many opportunities in the day to come out to get sunlight uh, why is that healthy uh, i have explained in an earlier webinar so uh, and of course everybody would like to you know uh, live uh, in their family unit by themselves and across in the eco village for the convenience there is a common kitchen many facilities are common but every family would definitely like to have their own private time. And if there is a water body or a lake that's common to, you know, uh, three, four of such villages could have a common water body. For example, small state like Goa, we uh, think we have about 12 lakh people. So 
all that we need to do is have about 24 of these zones to take, take care of our population. Um, of course, it's already there and whatever is there existing, we could design it to work in a nice holistic way. And this is for greenfield projects where you do it completely new. So it's uh, very much the old design that was uh, there since centuries. Uh, and uh, you know, with all of this modern innovation and this hopeless model of cities, we began to, uh, uh, you know, forget these uh, natural time-tested village designs. But now it's turning out, it's turning out that we have to get back to it. So some things that uh, uh, just a brief mention of our eco-village, uh, just to show you the different areas, um, it is a, a designed to be a, a self-sufficient village that will have products and services that will generate income. So we are planning for a very prosperous uh, place, a very functional place that will have not only a uh, staying capacity for people, but also a uh, staying capacity for visitors who will come to our education centers, to our wellness centers, to our recreation centers. Because this is the design we want to share with people not only in India, but across the globe. Because we have clearly understood that this is the you know, future of this planet if we want to uh, you know, survive and have a healthy and uh, beautiful life. So you can see all the different centers that are uh, just like how you would have in the modern world. But uh, each of these centers comes with the correct an analysis of its requirement and its uh, proper functioning as per natural laws. And it's also being done in a phase-wise uh, manner. So in the first phase, the main builders, the scientists, the people are going to work on the land, they come in in the first phase. Then in the second phase, we have the teachers who come in and the medicine people who come in and start setting up all those facilities. And then finally, we have the uh, people who are, uh, you know, going to uh, reside over there who are not builders and not teachers and not, uh, you know, um, uh, scientists. And uh, then besides that, we will have, uh, you know, a surplus accommodation for all the visitors and uh, the wellness center, education center and all of that. So just a uh, last slide on that is that uh, uh, yes, the founding members will be people who will bring in money uh, to build all of these facilities or we may have a joint venture with the landowner and create this community because the community is going to create products and services. So it's like a business as well. So we are also looking at that option where we could get into a joint venture with somebody who has the land so that we don't have to pay for the land, at least all of it, we could pay for some of it. And then we could uh, show a very de detailed you know, business plan that would return money uh, to the, the owner. Because anyway, what will the owner do by, what will they do with the money? They're going to invest it in some other industry. And is that industry costing the earth? That is, you know, very important. So now in this community, uh, the funding will come from some of the, you know, uh, uh, core members. And uh, it's about uh, two crores for this 500 square meter, you know, uh, space, which is the normal land cost in Goa, if it's done in a, if it's a good place. And um, then additional to that is the, building material cost of, you know, the, this uh, wonderful villa. So generally this would cost uh, about three crores, but uh, we are trying to get uh, key people come in first with this and then whatever funding is short, we could get loans uh, because this is a proper uh, business uh, plan. And then there will be some people who do not have money so here are some details and uh, any of you who want to get into it and are really interested, go to my website, darryldisouza.com 
over there you'll see uh, on that one page itself uh, eco village in goa and then you'll see this pdf document which you can download and you'll read all of these details there so uh, as long as uh, people come there and they're ready to work whether it is three hours a day five days a week or three hours in the morning and three hours in the evening uh, five days a week again okay? because we're trying to keep it very comfortable if they've got out from the rat race you know we need to make things uh, much easier here for a holistic and beautiful life and a healthy life so um yeah so people who you know uh, do not have any funds then they can always come in but I, like i mentioned it will be have it will have to be as per the phases of the project that means the first phase mainly the people who are building the community the second phase the people who are you know teaching and uh, uh, the healers and therapists and the third phase would be people who want to uh, stay there so it's uh, people come in with uh, the skills that they have and that they can give those services or make those kind of products in the community and uh, uh, one principle is that uh, you know as so i'll come to that currency part of it um, one principle is that everybody's uh, time is valued the same whether you were educated in harvard or whether you were educated in the village as long as you are putting in time to a certain thing for an amount of time uh, you know you get the same uh, kind of uh, 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 not payment uh, for example if uh, uh, most of this is a barter so if you do the uh, three hours per day, then you are going to get your stay free. And if you do the six hours per day, then you're going to get your stay and your food free and certain basic, you know, uh, goods and services that are a necessary part of life. And if you do more than that, because you're enthusiastic and you want to do something, then there will be a local currency of the community. So I'll come to that. And with that local currency, you can, well, uh, take some days off and pay a little bit of your rent or you can give that uh, you know use that currency for your friends or visitors who come in the commu uh, community to stay and you can give them uh, a stay or some health treatment or some education uh, program and of course there are details for children and uh, senior citizens who are dependents they can be there in the community but they uh, have to be there with some you know, or they are dependent on something. So the core people who are living in the place, uh, that base has to be there. Now, finally coming to uh, currency and money. Now, once you're in a eco village like this, where knowledge is complete, where actually people do not need currency much if they are active in the community or even if they've got their grandparents and all you know staying in the villa it's just uh, a man and a woman who is working they could uh, the children don't need to work and the poor grandparents don't need to work so um, just by uh, doing your part then uh, the rest of your family could get all their stay and food and basic goods and services so there is actually no basic uh, need for daily transactions. But like I said, people will put in more time and they will want some value for it. So that value can come uh, from the community in a very natural way. It has been happening earlier also. So instead of again, you know, mining metals, whether it is gold, silver or nickel or whatever, we can have a, a simple currency made of clay. Of course, uh, for it to be made unique, there has to be a proper detail insignia that can be stamped but with the die that is very specific to that community. So all those details are there. Uh, so people can use a local currency uh, for exchange within the community. Now, the important part to understand is once you are self-sufficient in your community, now, of course, when we build the community, uh, we will have to buy uh, building materials and you know contract laborers and so many people from outside the community. So yes, 
the existing uh, money system that is there. You will have some money with you, then you can pay that because the outside world is just going to use gold or silver or printed currency. So you only need a printed currency with you till the time your community is built. Once your community is built, uh, then uh, you are self-sufficient and you actually do not need anything from the outside world. You could be taking a barter from another community. So I'll come to that part. But uh, the main thing about uh, asset-backed currency. So for your community, what are the real assets? The real assets is your land, is the minerals inside your land. Of course, you will not want to mine it if you worked out your model well and you do not need to create machines to the mining and all of that. So that's an asset that will always be there. But that's the value of a community. The land, the water, then most important is the trees and all the plant kingdom that's there in your community. You can increase the value of that. And, uh, you know, even double it if your land has not got so many trees. So that is a renewable asset. And the reason why I showed all of these aspects of the plant kingdom, that they give us life, they give us food, they give us uh, medicine, they, they give us all so many of our utensils, they build our homes, they build our boxes, our chairs and everything. So that's why the trees are the real asset and the amount of trees, the kind of trees uh, that you have in your land that we can be converted to goods and services, that is the actual real asset valuation. And is it in, isn't it great that an intelligent community who can take care of their trees will have a higher valuation than those who have not taken the trouble or don't know the science and the trees are going down, then obviously they are an unsuccessful community. And why should they have a higher valuation in the first place if that's the way they are going down? This is the natural law of nature itself. Those who are successful with the natural sciences, they survive. Those who have made mistakes, uh, those civilizations fell. So, um, so that is uh, one uh, point that I wanted to make. This is the real world of real assets. And all of this, you know, uh, is uh, uh, what I call uh, asset-backed real currency. The real currency of between people is, of course, energy and work and products and services. Even a product in the in the village that's made over there will have the number of man hours that has gone into that product, and so the basis of that pricing is very concrete. And then, of course, if there there are stores, many stores in the community for when people come from outside to buy. And there'll be a margin that the store person will put on that. So all those things will be regulated to be very ethical. And uh, once your community is uh, self-sufficient, then uh, anybody, what would uh, gold or gemstone or paper money do for you? You only need what your community needs. So maybe you need some different kind of grains uh, that do not grow well in your soil. Or maybe uh, the manufacturing capacity of your cloth and all is less, so you want cloth from the outside. You actually want uh, goods, you know, uh, in barter. And nobody is going to take your coins in the outside world. So cross communities, it's mainly going to go as per barter. And then, of course, if you are having visitors and if you are having... Uh, people coming in for education, for health, for retreats, and all of that, then you always at your own free will, you have an inflow of uh, this paper currency, which you can always uh, pay off. So it actually turns out at one point of time, when you're self-sufficient, you don't even need the money from the outside world. And then it's up to communities to just decide, you know, uh, when people come from outside, uh, how do they pay? Do they pay by... Uh, money or do they pay by something that the community needs? So what I've talked about is such a level of self-sufficiency where uh, you are sitting on real assets that and the main asset is the entire plant kingdom that provides you everything that you need in life. And of course the design we will talk of you know sometime later how houses are designed to work on less electricity or no electricity 
I've li lived like that in this home in Goa in the 1980s. A wonderful life. Uh, we used to get up at the time the sun would come up and I they used to end by the time the sun would go down and then in the evening we just have some oil lamps and all of that. Now you can make that also oil you can make from the plant kingdom. So it's a renewable resource, right? Um, so very amazing, innovative and creative way of living and most of all health. Um, and uh, of course, we can make our spaces very comfortable, very beautiful, very artistic. Music, song, dance will all be live things happening in front of you in the you know community center, and not something that you need to put on the TV or the internet to switch on. You know, you don't need so the amount of electricity and all of that will also be very less. So. Now, how, how do we, you know, get ahead and implement such projects? Um, so I had already started this uh, in one of the earlier webinars where people who have this kind of knowledge, you know, domain experts uh, who have been doing these projects and these are all the people that we have been uh, showcasing and they have been presenting on the New Earth Summit, right, from 2019. So we had 30 uh, speakers in 2019. Then it went, uh, because of COVID, it went to a webinar style. So we had three or four panelists in 2020, taking it to over 100 uh, presenters. So all our videos are there. So it's 30 uh, videos for mind, body, spirit, uh, uh, you know, changing our problems and uh, into solutions. Okay, providing solutions for all of these things. So mind, body, spirit, uh, health, that food and farming and environment solutions and sustainability, natural uh, homes, rainwater harvesting, all of these. Uh, they are all the three years, that means even this year, it's all in the design of what uh, I have called, uh, you know, new earth, making of new earth. So uh, to do this, of course, you, if you are trying, going to get any of these guys from these existing universities, they are going to uh, manifest the same mess that you are living in. So you need to get people who are on this summit and similar thinking people from across India, across the world, and mainly work in your state to build uh, at least the, the area that is there, which is you know, still not used. You can start making these communities. And the concrete jungles that you have created, well, they have their time. Some buildings will fail after 10 years, some after 20 years, some after 30 years. And uh, if you have these places ready, and you've done a good job of making them self-sufficient and beautiful and healthy and artistic, then automatically people will come here. It's a no-brainer. You see, they are living in a sick place. Uh, and, uh, you know, and whenever they get some time or a vacation, they always come to the countryside. So there is a, there's no doubt that if we make beautiful places, people will transition to these places. And um, this is the time on the planet, I think, uh, all of these new screen sciences are coming out by innovators and people who are thinking right and living by and practicing and teaching natural laws. So for that, uh, here's a list of committees that uh, we will be forming in Goa and I think similar need to form in you know, every state in this country and across uh, uh, countries. Uh, basically, it's a people's movement where um, all of the us who want to live a natural life and of course we are doing good work why would the government you know uh, be opposing they would always welcome things and solutions i mean even uh, two days back i presented on an international uh, BRICS uh, conference and they were so glad that uh, you know the integrated natural medicine uh, uh, system that i had proposed with the best of modern medicine along with complementary medicine alternative medicine and the ancient healing sciences so even at the government level, people know they are in a complete mess and our future is not showing more than 25 years. And who wants to perish and, you know, go out into the night? So, so we are, uh, it's a very genuine effort uh, where we can showcase all these uh, wonderful, you know, uh, systems. So it's there in health and medicine natural food and farming, you know that these are all topics that are on the New Earth Summit. The jobs and green businesses uh, webinar is still coming up and even uh, the webinars on this. 
water and uh, potion and this is in for a big revamp which is going on now across the world holistic education basically the education that is teaching all these new integrated natural system so this is just a few of the committees then you will also have the you know um, uh, power or uh, renewable uh, energy or uh, you know committee or the existing electricity committee roads committee and all of that but uh, uh, these are some of the very key ones uh, to you know maintaining and uh, establishing this natural eco village so um, i wish uh, everybody thinks in this direction and starts working towards it um, i am working with some uh, groups who have also come up, come up on the same model and we are integrating this all of it uh, in uh, delhi so some of you are in delhi please get in touch with me the dates uh, for our integration meet are uh, in december of course after the summit uh, and it's going to be on 8 9 10 in uh, in delhi so if you have designed uh, such a system or you want to understand them more deeply you have doubts and you want to get on the drawing board with us uh, definitely you know get in touch with me i'll let you know how to connect with us and uh, i'm looking forward to your yeah, people from across the country to also be part of this uh, these ideas are there with many people they just want uh, the right kind of people to associate with them and take the movement forward and uh, even now uh, wherever we have our wellness center this is what i started doing you know in uh, uh, jan of uh, 2000 uh, just before the pandemic started at my wellness center in goa uh, promoting this kind of eco community and uh, you know uh, having the organic market with natural food body products and all of these utilities that we use from morning to evening uh, every day then screening movies on uh, these kind of innovative green solutions we have to start you know not waste any time start educating people and the best thing you can do is uh, show people the videos of the new earth summit we have a youtube channel also the new earth summit and of course you will have uh, also another big range uh, from across the world but people in india do connect and uh, you know let's get on this job of making a beautiful world for all of us thank you thank you daryl for the wonderful presentation i'll now be taking questions from the audience in fact we have a first question from gaia earth sansar who asks how about the indigenous animals or the fauna do you see greater need for animal man animal harmony and synergies instead of man animal conflicts flora and fauna that includes humans must go hand in hand yes so there's a very important uh, aspect of that and uh, that's where the domestic animals come in between see like our dogs cats their chickens or goats and you know cows and all of that um because uh, if not for these uh, animals that were docile we would only have the wild animals in the forest and then it would really be uh, always you know the tigers and the hyenas and the foxes and the bears uh, it would have always been us against them so uh, the domestic animals are an interface which uh, teaches we can uh, uh, interact with all of these other species whether it's you know birds also and uh, squirrels or whatever uh, that uh, it helps to bridge that gap and for us to know these other species and be more compassionate to them and understand also that each of them has their own environment and this typical you know villa uh, of uh, four bedrooms with 500 uh, square meters around it it also allows the dogs and the cats you know of your own home to have their own territory because they are at least dogs are very territorial and i've seen it in cities that uh, you know when they are so close by they are barking and fighting all the time there's no territory to protect you see 
so we have to uh, so we have taken that also into the design of the community that you must have space from your neighbors you must have space to have these animals around you to have a, you know social life with them because they are the bridge to understanding other animals um, so yes i think they are an integral part of our life and uh, uh, but we have to, you know, include them and not uh, exploit them, and uh, especially, you know, torture them. Like even that's why I have become a, a vegan. That is a person who only lives on uh, plant-based produce, because I've seen it from the scientific angle aspect of it. I have seen very deeply on not only through science, but in plant medicine, I've seen the flow of life and nutrients, you know, like molecules and uh, energy uh, through all of this and i have completely understood the science of how human beings can completely live off uh, you know plant based food so uh, we don't need uh, the eggs of you know um, uh, chickens and we don't need to you know kill the bees and destroy their beehives and we don't need to go and take the milk from the cow when it's uh, supposed to be given to her calf we don't need to torture animals and uh, that's what we'll be doing in our eco community. It's a threefold path of ahimsa. And one is non violence to the human body, what I had presented. That is why, you know, all these toxic food and toxic body products, we are, they're a living organism. And, but, you know, uh, subconsciously or uh, without knowing, we are trying to kill ourselves every day with these toxic products. The second was non violence to the animals. So let them have their life and uh, let us have a social interaction with them and then of course the third was non-violence to mother earth and this um, entire city-based model which i call the graveyards of humanity is the biggest violence that has ever happened in the history of this planet and to mother earth and uh, it is time we correct it and uh, you know, it's not just a scientific lesson that uh, I am talking about. Uh, it's a spiritual lesson as well, which I spoke at the Third World Parliament on spirituality. There's so much, uh, and people, you know, realize that uh, how come this was not taught in our university? How come it's not taught in schools? Well, I said, yes, it's not taught, and the result of that is this damaged and broken world that you, we are living in. So, uh, Yes, it's high time. Thank you for answering that. We have a, another question from Ashish Mukherjee. Um, he, he asks, what is your experience of spiritual significance of Mandala Vatikas? Mandala Vatikas? Vatikas. I, uh, if you could just break down that term, of course, I know what Mandalas are. But Vatika, I don't know what that is. But uh, uh, all of uh, this is a subject that I uh, teach in my spiritual retreats uh, of um, entire creation, how it happens to how it happened and continues to happen every day, every minute as creation progresses through sacred geometry. So, what is sacred geometry? It's the uh, you know the different forms, the natural uh, living forms, and um, Yes, I, I believe in that very deeply, and that's from where you have the design of uh, you know, natural homes. Anything that's natural will follow sacred geometry. Um, so, yes, uh, uh, I, I, for me, uh, uh, it is a balance of both uh, science and uh, spirituality or intuition or wisdom or you know, spirit uh, participating. Um, and I have, uh, it's on my spiritual website also, this topic in depth uh, of uh, rea reality is what it is. When we perceive it more from our left brain, we see it as a science and we know the science about it. When we perceive it from our right brain, we see the experiential aspect of it and we call it as energy flow and uh, that's the spiritual part of it. Uh, so... Yes, uh, uh, mandalas are a very deep aspect. When you see it from the scientific part, it's called sacred geometry. When you see it in form flowing and what comes out through your hands in pottery or through your you know, carpentry, that's the experience of bringing out those sacred uh, uh, 
you know uh, shape if you are in tune uh, deeper you know uh, i've seen the flower of life which is called you know the starting point of sacred geometry i've seen it at taj mahal also i've seen it at the golden temple also and uh, which shows that all of these great uh, uh, masons uh, who made these great structures they have been in the pyramid they knew that uh, all of life comes through uh, design and through science of a uh, creator and even the petals of a flower or a shape of a leaf it also comes through you know the sacred geometry and uh, mandalas so well mandalas are also finally how all living things interact with each other and how their energy lines cross and these you uh, visually see during your you know the sacred plant ceremony and that's what i had been through also i could see my energy lines you know uh, connecting with the earth lines and with the trees around me it's a really beautiful experience and uh, uh, yeah i finally wanted to say that um, uh, this plant uh, you know medicine experiences should be done by people who are uh very senior and uh, uh medicine men and shamans because uh they are adept uh, in uh, helping people experience these uh, deeper sciences uh through deep uh, you know states of uh, awareness thank you daryl another question from ashish mukherjee how many people have signed up for the community and in a matter of currency who will be the issuing authority this is where the scam lies in the current central banking system yeah so we have about 30 uh, 40 people who are part of our co uh, village and have, want to be part of it and besides that there are another probably 150 who have been waiting since the last 5 years that i have been talking about it but um, uh, we are at the stage now of finalizing the land. We've seen two, three places in Goa of 1,000 acres. And uh, this all actually came to a halt when this you know, pandemic uh, uh, started happening uh, across the globe. So uh, my attention also got diverted to certain fraudulent aspects of the pandemic that were coming through fake uh, medical science. And that's when I got uh, involved with Awaken in India movement. So uh, this community, you know, taking up the land and all of that has slowed down. It's, it's been a kind of pause since a whole year. Um, yes, and uh, in uh, the community, uh, yes, there's going to be an, uh, you know, exercise of, uh, uh, you know, keeping books of the current assets uh, of the community. The issuing authority, of course, will be within the community itself. Right? We have a council. And uh, currency first starts by because your existing assets, right? They're your asset base. You're not creating them, most of it to just sell it out. Uh, if you give anything from your community to somebody outside, they are most probably going to try to uh, pay you in the fiat currency or gold and all of that. So only to the extent that you, you need something from the outside world, Right, because the outside world will give you only in this fiat currency. It's only at the time that you need something. Till then, you will uh, be okay with giving out products and services and taking fiat currency. But I said, like I said, that cycle will complete in uh, for us within I think about three years, or even till the third year. The, the third phase will be going on. Still, we will be taking you know uh, outside money. So it could be uh, ending in five years. Within five years, we will not need. Uh, any money from the outside world and that's the time you could say our community uh, all the assets are completely developed now at that point of time uh, even for outside people to come in i mean we don't need visitors and to give people you know education or uh, different things for their money because we don't need their money maybe uh, you know uh, they could give us some other kind of part or they could bring some products that, uh, and services that we need. Even they would uh, be wanting to teach us some things that are upgrading in the world or something. So we come to a point where uh, the local currency is only uh, being issued uh, on the 
basis of what is called sweat equity. Okay, that means um, if I am doing all of my work uh, at a regular le uh, level that based on my staying in my food, then the equation is fine. I don't need money. But if I do something extra, and then I would like to have something in return uh, for that, right? Uh, what if I do extra? I want to account for it so I can use it some in the community. Like I said, maybe I take some days off. I take uh, two weeks off. And because of that, obviously, then my rent doesn't get paid. So I give this excess money that I need. So the issuing authority will be within the organization. It will depend on this person who does the excess work. It is logged, it is known in the community, there's a ledger maintained, and for that work, they get these certain different currencies will be there, like I said, by clay. So, but of course, there is a, a special stamp and emblem on it that is not easily copied. Uh, uh, so that is what we will follow. So issuing authority will be within the community. And for this one reason that you have done the work, it is the return for your sweat equity that you have something in your pocket that you can start exchange. So the generation of money happens at that point. It's not that uh, we are going to be creating, you know, so many clay coins, which is uh, equal to all the assets that we have. Uh, there's no point in that, right? We, uh, because it does nothing for us. Uh, we are not going to sell, uh, this our assets out and we don't want fiat currency from outside. So yes, I also wanted questions from the audience. If there were certain aspects of your daily life that you think uh, in a uh, eco village that you may not get, uh, like I said once before, we hardly need any mobiles over there um, because um, you know all of knowledge and the regular meetings uh, and communication happens within the group. Uh, the Eco village people themselves, the designers are, you know, knowledge complete. Of course, we will always have uh, people from other eco villages. Uh, this is also an ongoing trend across the globe right now. The seniors from certain eco villages, they re visit other eco villages to teach and also to learn certain things. So that's how cross learning from across the globe happens. And of course, the, the most important learning for an eco village is the science of your zone, your place, as per your trees, as per your environment, as per your soil, that's the most important thing. So we have to go back to indigenous wisdom and to the ancestors and to our villagers and to our tribals and learn so many things from them about our land. That's also part of the project. Welcome Chandravika Sri, good evening. Yeah, namaste. Welcome. Uh, hello. So, um, there is uh, my uh, viewpoint uh, where, you know, uh, I believe that uh, there are two extremes kind of uh, in play, uh, which are both, uh, I would say, in some kind of a time war. So, one is the fossil fuel industry. And, uh, you know, now I'll just share one anecdote uh, from very recent uh, last few days. Uh, is that uh, after the COP26, uh, there was a, uh, you know, question. Can you and explain that word to people? Everybody may not yeah. know the meaning of Right. Conference. So that's the conference of parties, uh, or the 26th meeting of the United Nations Climate Change Convention uh, that just uh, completed in Glasgow uh, on December 12th, just a few days back. And in that, uh, there are targets set called net zero by 2050. Uh, even our Prime Minister Modi has committed to get to net zero by 2070. Uh, he's uh, shared some five uh, prong approach called Pancha Amri. So that's uh, also so renewable energy, 500 uh, 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 gigawatts by 2030. So this is uh, one uh, part of it. Now, uh, my point is that, uh, you know, as it's been uh, widely published that uh, the largest delegation at this uh, climate summit was the fossil fuel industry. And uh, as a MP from, uh, you know, uh, England a few days later, I mean, just last two days, shared that uh, his constituency is not concerned about, uh, you know, the Great Barrier Reef or whatever he believes to be 
you know, misplaced uh, urgency on climate action. Now, he says that uh, my constituency is more concerned about the heating bill. And for that, uh, Britain must uh, tap its indigenous gas supply. So the word indigenous is being used in terms of, uh, you know, accessing all the, uh, what they believe is, as their, uh, you know, right uh, to uh, exploit uh, all the uh, fossil fuels. Uh, so that's one set of, uh, you know, constituency in the time war. Uh, I also see that at the other extreme, uh, a point of view like yours, uh, you know, which seems to be very cut and dried from uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the everyday uh, uh, jostles of the, uh, you know, a large number of people, uh, you know, who are marginalized, who are underprivileged, who are already victims uh, of the current system. Uh, children who are staring, uh, you know, into uh, darkness and, uh, you know, and a bottomless abyss, uh, not very far off, but maybe in just next 10, 20 years. So in that, the kind of incrementalism that you seem to advocate, you know, where you take just 1,000 acres in Goa at, at a time for, and then it gets interrupted by COVID, um, you know, pandemic, and uh, just 40 people. I think, you know, it's time to step up and raise the bar and truly get uh, cracking on creating a global mandate for eco-villages, for like the five by five kilometer uh, framework that you share, that should become part and parcel of what I shared in the earlier session as United Nations Declaration for Rights of Indigenous People, which was signed unanimously by all the countries in 2007 itself. So it's already been 14 years. So unless we start asking very, pointed and very you know, strident questions, like how, uh, you know, uh, one uh, lady journalist, uh, I'm just missing her name, uh, she asked Nancy Pelosi uh, about uh, the US military being the world's largest polluter and how you defend its ex continued expansion uh, in the face of, Abby Martin, I think was the journalist, uh, in the face of uh, commitments of net zero, and Nancy Pelosi made a very convoluted argument saying that, uh, you know, we see climate uh, catastrophe as a national security threat. And because it's a national security threat, we, want, we need to expand the U.S. military and its uh, carbon footprint. So I think, you know, the, uh, both uh, the segments, uh, let me put it very candidly, have kind of lost it. They, they don't have the grip over the reality of, uh, uh, you know, uh, how bad the situation really is, how urgently we need to um, act on it at a much larger scale than what you seem to fathom. And that is where, uh, you know, my uh, viewpoint on the uh, LACE model and uh, the LACE Gaia model, which is an integration where uh, I'm questioning the very validity of the United Nations itself as the uh, largest uh, and the most influential world body. I mean, uh, how come a body gives so much of veto power to the aggressors of the Second World War and who in turn gets so, uh, you know, co-opted by the uh, oil industry and now with the pharma industry. So unless we uh, give a roadmap which uh, specifically tells people that uh, if you want to create a plant-based uh, economy, and I also believe that that's also a uh, you know straight jacketed argument. I think veganism is a uh, you know kind of a, uh, uh, you know rebound of the excessive industrial uh, animal farms. Uh, in the in the real sense, I think what I also put as a question that flora and fauna go hand in hand. You may not like to eat meat. But for some people, that choice will be there because there are different breeding rates of different species. There is a natural predator-prey relationship. There is a man-animal bonding. So in that, you know, just as we uh, pluck a leaf uh, or, you know, uh, we uh, pluck a, a fruit or uh, rather we forage. Similarly, there are, you know, there must be an openness uh, to diverse choices which are sustainable which and all of that may, must be respectful 
So what I learned from the indigenous communities is that even if you pluck a fruit, it should you should first go to the tree with lots of respect that you know you are seeking a gift from the tree. Similarly, even if they are uh, you know eating poultry or uh, you know some kind of animal meat, even if let's say after feeding the calf they are taking some portion of the milk, I think you know these choices must be respected. Uh, whereas uh, people who want to stay strictly plant-based vegan uh, on raw food uh, must also be respected. So I think there must be a harmonious coexistence of all these choices which will together lead us to a holistic solution and also at a speed which matches, uh, which can overwhelm the rate of deterioration, the loss of livelihoods that will happen when we want the fossil fuel industry to shut down must be compensated at a grand scale by the plant-based economy. It must be able to generate so many livelihoods all over the world, uh, especially it should allow uh, migration from the uh, densely populated areas to the scantily populated areas like Canada and Australia, where uh, their dependence on machines uh, and on fossil fuel is primarily because they don't have working hands. Uh, similarly, in uh, certain countries, there are a uh, disproportionately high number of elderly people who are not in the you know, working uh, age group. So those kind of imbalances need to be addressed in a holistic way if we are to achieve uh, our vision and our dream and aspirations of a truly planned and, um, uh, you know, I would say some animal-based economy. I would uh, uh, broadly put it as a livestock economy rather than a dead stock economy uh, powered by fossil fuels. So that's one part. The second part, why we need to get lots more ambitious and we need to raise the bar, is that uh, when we talk about currency, we are still trapped into a debauched currency like dollars or the Indian rupee, which we all very well know is controlled by the cabal through the reserve banking system and through the fractional uh, reserve system by which uh, you know, you just um, create money like, uh, you know, in thin air. So if we want, uh, um, you know, local currencies rather than printing something, why not simply use grain as uh, currency, food as currency? And why not create a codes of uh, conduct? Why not create, you know, community uh, uh, pricing indexes, uh, indices, which uh, uh, are mapped to the amount of labor or the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, kind of harvesting cycle of uh, particular fruits or particular, uh, you know, grains. So if we create can that kind of a commodity index in every um, uh, community, like you talk about the eco-village or the self-sustained state, uh, then uh, we don't need, uh, you know, an actual currency. It could just be information and it could be uh, like what uh, uh, Bharat Bhushan Diagiji talks about as a resource bank and as a labor bank. So whatever uh, uh, harvest that you bring, uh, products or services that you contribute gets uh, um, uh, you know credited to your account and uh, whatever you uh, spend uh, gets debited. So by this kind of register, the local community economy works. Whereas some of the residual needs, which will continue to be there, maybe you know there's some global uh, meat once in a year or twice in a year. There may be some you know uh, tourism, uh, some kind of scholar uh, scholarly visits. So all that needs to be paid in a global currency. For that, we must firstly disown the U.S. dollar or the Indian rupee, and instead we must create something like a Gaia currency, as I have proposed which uh, is a map to real assets and the convertibility to local currencies is also uh, very transparent, very objective and very fair. So this, I, I would just like to uh, keep, uh, put this canvas as to um, and share, uh, seek opinion and feedback from all our participants and of course from yourself. Yes, yes. thank you uh, Chandrikashi. So, Yes, on the first point, uh, eco village is uh, not for 40 people. That is the starting team that we are working with. It's uh, it's for 600 people. That's the design. 
and the very comfortable design we're not trying to put in as many people as possible so uh, and that's also with an average of uh, 600 acres so if we are doing 1000 uh, acres definitely we could be 1000 people also but so that's a design of its own for a certain uh, model and as per our comfort but for the regular living model what i had shared was that uh, across 6177 acres having 50000 people so that is uh, similar to the wadis or the wadas that we have already been doing much earlier you know before all of this modern concrete jungle scheme now um, in terms of uh, how slow or fast things can happen yes i understand that there is a great emergency right now and uh, that is why uh, the, the i put up that uh, entire slide of the committees so committees get together and can start working within a month's time to change policy within the state so that's the fast track of having very good domain experts and uh, getting together with them and of course uh, uh, that's why i talked about uh, delhi meeting in delhi in uh, the second week uh, so these things can move at a much uh, faster space. Uh, so, of course, this one angle of it is uh, building these eco communities and this new system. The other angle is parallelly working on the existing system and with the existing policy uh, politicians asking the right questions and, you know, taking up the uh, United Nations, the faulty aspects of the agenda. That can also, of course, it uh, necessarily has to happen uh, right now. Um, so the challenge on that side but at the same time moving ahead with our solution because as far as i have seen and we have seen over the decades you know there are promises there are promises but with every year that is passing by the world is just uh, this is the key factor uh, in terms of people's life and you know the earth every day that is passing uh, you know we can see their actions that are making holes in the earth now, compared to that they're putting up these committees and the models and the sciences to do the exact opposite that is no uh, this so people i think you know as soon as we create these spaces uh, and it's not just the eco village uh, it can be at the space of once this idea is out in any existing village and we speak to the you know uh, panchayats and to the authorities about a certain amount of population density and get some understanding and agreement with them even existing houses can start happening all across the place within three to six months. We don't have to wait for eco-villages to come everywhere, which will take one to three years, like I talked about. So the main thing is this, uh, every day, uh, we need to uh, put uh, these measures through these committees. And that's the reason I'm talking about it on this uh, webinar also. So the common public also understands these metrics, what I have put today on this webinar, right? everything from morning to evening that's just an exercise everybody has to do what am i taking uh, and using from where is it coming and what kind of industry am i supporting so the, the action starts from today itself the action starts from tomorrow itself start uh, stepping out of the system and find there will be already some natural uh, you know producers of all of these goods so seek them out in your city in your communities and start going to the organic markets and participating because once you buy from them, you will, the economy on that side of natural will start building up. Because all of these things are sustained through economy, and economy only comes through people's participation. So, yes, uh, definitely we can fast track this. And uh, on your uh, point of currency, uh, yes, I understand that uh, uh, it can be, uh, it, essentially it's a barter, whether it's grains or any other things and uh, in the system. And uh, if not a barter, you are keeping some uh, digital, you know, equivalent of it in a ledger in uh, your account. And uh, yes, that is also doable, but we clearly saw that um, that would create the necessity of more computers and all of that for people also to be interacting with those machines. Uh, so we thought uh, instead of storing it in the computer at the point when a currency, uh, when value is created and it needs to be uh, preserved with somebody in a form, we can do these, you know, clay coins and all of that. So that was more to the design of, you know, a more uh, uh, natural system. But definitely there's a transition point where we can use, you know, uh, computers right now to make all this digital but I see our design as very natural and organic, so it can happen fast.
with covid uh, uh, and what's going on in the world it's actually a world war third world war is going on between the capitalists and the people who are trying to you know hijack humanity's health and uh, trying to you know depopulate the planet by all of their medical means uh, it is very clear that there is a, a third world war by globalists against uh, people in different countries uh, so yes that uh, whatever actions need to be taken right now have to be taken by the military or the governments or whatever whoever is getting involved and at uh, the same time those of us who can do work for this alternative you know uh, aspect of uh, creating a better communities we should work on it every day yeah on the point of what you mentioned about you know the freedom for uh, people to uh, have animal agriculture and to feed on animals um i believe uh, because it is already proven now through the medical sciences route that uh, you know uh, and evidence based uh, that human beings actually do not need any uh, meat to sustain so we are leaving it at that point where people will choose you see their freedom they said i have the freedom to eat an animal but uh, it should be very clear to people uh, it is by killing life that they are eating it if people understand something as karma or killing something else they should be very clear that yes you know uh, this is what i'm doing for example uh, animals also have a right to live and we also have a right to peaceful existence and uh, uh, so there are the two three aspects of it one is of course uh, not eating animals uh, for the scientific aspect which is for better health uh, second is again for non violence to the uh, to the animal species other species on our planet and then third is the ecological uh, you know devastation that is caused by such a big uh, meat industry all across the globe um so two are directly hitting human beings that is your daily health and the daily uh, you know abuse of mother earth uh, that is happening with every you know uh, commercial uh, reproduced animal that you eat uh, so yeah people uh, should know very clearly that uh, their choice of eating meat comes at the rate, uh, risk of uh, at, at, by them violating three other rights yeah which is the the right to their own good health that's the first thing they are violating the second is the animal rights and the third is you know the the right for mother earth to heal faster and give a future to humanity i think those are much uh, all three of them standing on by their on their own are much uh, bigger and more important than a person's you know uh, just a choice uh, to eat meat yeah no uh, i'd like to make two points uh, is that uh, you mentioned that uh, there will be need for more computers and mobile phones when there is a digital register uh, but uh, you know it could be made much simpler in a way that a price chart could be published every daily or periodically which could just be on you know a uh, kind of a chalkboard uh you know and uh, uh, that doesn't need to change too much uh, you know unless there is an exceptional uh, you know drought or some kind of condition uh, that's number one uh, the second part deril what i have been trying to sensitize for you know uh, nearly uh, two decades of uh, my activism as an ecological uh, warrior is that uh, you know there is a non violence aspect uh, when we talk about animals that i fully uh, appreciate and uh, i'm also you know i had almost given up meat i'll be very uh, transparent about it but the family choices and the kind of milieu you are in uh, sometimes i mean i'm not a complete uh, zero uh, you know i i do eat meat uh, once in a while and when you eat it then so but the sense of respect like just like we have towards uh, animals towards plants that we are uh, eating them should be there but my other bigger point is that uh, the fossil fuel industry is uh, about violence uh, to uh, mother earth and not just uh, to mother earth through uh, that uh, the uh, you know the repercussions of burning fossil fuel uh, has on uh, you know climate disasters which also take so many lives so many innocent lives so similarly uh, the breathlessness that we can feel in delhi ncr and so many other places 
uh, because of the fossil fuel burning primarily uh, is again an act of violence so uh, one could be a vegan but still many of them i see are you know kind of motor car lovers they wouldn't give up their motor cars they wouldn't give up their air conditioners running on diesel generators in you know societies which are which have a gentry of highly educated and so called you know posh uh, colonies in uh, you know big cities so how do you uh, you know address this hypocrisy and this dichotomy uh, why not uh, non violence uh, should have a fourth thing about giving up fossil fuels altogether that's also i believe an act of violence yes very true and uh, let me make it you know very clear that uh, yes uh, people know from uh, uh, i'm not a you know vegan activist uh i came into uh, not eating uh, you know meat firstly for health reasons and then of course the compassion was already there from earlier i was a person who never put chain a dog or keep it closed in the house right from my childhood which i think is also uh, you know not a really good thing for an animal so to get so stressed up and you know kind of uh, blair their throat out so uh, for me uh, a vegan is not a benchmark at all uh for me the benchmark is an earth keeper and that's what i've always been since i started doing public work in 2010 and uh, uh so the earth keeper is uh, that philosophy of a uh, non violence to the humans so it comes from the from the healthcare sciences uh, and it cares about uh, the flow that i uh, shared today that how plants you know bring us nutrition and how we have contaminated that entire cycle and uh, causing our own sickness uh, you know that's the first part so the people are into wellness uh, mind body spirit health uh, then they are also into well the uh, health and uh, you know the freedom of other species on this planet having come from the deep uh, sciences of uh, natural nutrition they don't uh, they know that they don't need to access uh, or traumatize animals for their food and then they are very uh, well aware and working on uh, you know all the sciences from the indigenous people and all to preserve the earth and not to you know uh, do all of this fossil fuel work and the mining and all of that so for me the real benchmark has always been and that's what i've been an earth keeper because you know uh, i was also matching with uh, uh, this aspect of uh, non violence to the animals and by default by my behavior itself i was uh, you know a uh, vegan because in 2010 i became a vegetarian and in 2005 itself i stopped drinking milk because i could see uh, digestive uh, problems with milk and then in 2013 i just realized well you know uh, i uh, have honey once in 3 months and i have you know eggs uh, once in 2 months and i really don't care you know and uh, if it's not there and of course for the animals i should do it and set a good example so i gave up uh, all of that in 2013 so that was to support uh, the cause which is a movement and it's you know it's good it's uh, fine but that's what i've been telling all of my vegan friends that you know they need to uh, widen their perspective and look at other aspects also besides animals they need to look at their own health and the health of the planet so that's been always my you know kind of interaction with them and uh, so i by no means am on this kind of you know on the vegan side only holding that uh, philosophy but i have always been an earth keeper uh, with all of this so i think what needs to happen is yes um, uh, all vegans should also wake up and so many are doing it in our existing groups where i'm uh, sharing uh, in our vegan groups where i'm sharing all of these uh, uh, summit details all of them are many of them uh, are slowly by every month is passing by they are taking up these causes as well and seeing them part of integrated you know uh, natural life and a necessary part of our future to protect our future to have a better future so i think yes people are you know uh even vegan now the other question on uh, use of fossil fuels as an act of violence especially in a critical situation like this right Yes, so of course, uh, I mean that's the model that uh, you know I have uh, put across, and uh, even when it comes to you know um, solar panels uh, and windmills, of course, creating all of these machines and all that, they also go to factories. Those factories run on electricity, 
which are run, run either by coal or by diesel and all of that, right? So it's still uh, making holes in the earth. So uh, that's why we are looking at a very organic, because even with solar and wind, uh, you know, those materials will uh, uh, get, you know, uh, uh, corroded by the time it's another 20 years. And our own children will be uh, calling us so stupid to have, you know, all that junk pile from across the planet uh, to deal with. So that's why the eco village and whatever we're doing on the new summit is just trying to make things as organic as possible. Um, so yes, definitely, uh, it it is uh, the message that is going out is to every person. Uh, basically, what am I engaging with every day of my life, and uh, you know how is it engaging with fossil fuels too? So I guess uh, people uh, right now cannot give up their cars if they're in the city. They can you know do carpooling and all of that and not drive the you know, car and take the bus or go by train. Those are the things they can do now. Um, but uh, so yes, uh, they can help in that way till the time they find a, a place like this or start building a place like this where they can reduce all that consumption. And you know, um, uh, it is almost yeah. It's 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 come to the place of emergency now. Why I'm saying you know these drastic things. That maybe we, uh, I'm designing the place not even to use a cycle or a tricycle. You know, that's only going to be used for uh, senior citizens or for children who will not be okay with walking long distances. Um, so ideally, I would not, you know, have to even have those. The the drasticness comes from the amount of abuse that has been done, and you know how much it is already damaging the earth. Like we had not caused such an accelerated, you know, uh, uh, contamination and destruction. Maybe we could have said, okay, let's phase out things in the next 30 years, you know, but it's uh, been so badly managed by all these global bodies and the globalists that uh, we are in a terrible situation and we have to act drastically. So I guess uh, people will, uh, according to their commitment and according to their opportunities and their need to do this, the very aggressive people will start making communities where there are no cycles also. The others will say, okay, I need certain con uh, convenience, I need some computers, we need some internet, some mobile, all of that. So I guess that's the, uh, you know, that's the transition phase. Um, but I truly believe the design that I talked of, of, about, you know, for the next 2,500 years itself, uh, it is uh, very organic with very, uh, you know, natural uh, things and no, no more holes in the earth. That's the first basic thing because it is already understood how you can live with what's coming up from the surface of the earth and have a complete and beautiful life. So those people who are most committed to it, they will participate first. Let's say that's the first phase and then we'll have second phase and third phase that will you know, come in. That's fine. So we're respecting people's choices and their situations and how fast they want to transit. And some people, if they are still doing their research on the numbers and all, fine, that's their freedom, let them do it. So we have another question. What sort of work will an eco village resident be involved in? So uh, yes, initially for the for the first three years, and I you know it will all be things that are going into building the community and to creating uh, product services routes and to making the community prosperous. And after that, it would be the ongoing activities that you would uh, see. Normally, that is happening in life. So, of course, uh, daily food is produced. Daily, there are going to be farmers. Teachers are going to be there doing work daily. There are going to be uh, 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 therapists and healers working daily. So, yes, so those are the kind of jobs that will be there. Uh, you may, uh, it, I mean, the question is included that, you know, suppose there are natural home builder. Right, and they come into your community, and all the homes are built in three years. So, what are they going to do then? Right? Yes, they could be people who are doing, uh, you know, maintenance, uh, or they could be doing some new innovation. And people generally, uh, over a period of two, three years, they learn how to, you know, change their skills as per what is required in the community. Or another beautiful thing that they could do is that uh, once their work, if they feel is complete with this community, they could take all those sciences and technologies and go and create another community. So that is for those people mainly who are in the first phase, who are in the building phase. But as I said, community will keep on expanding, you know, uh, and some structures will happen and uh, maintenance will be there. So, yes. And uh, for the rest of the time when everything is there, the regular work that you 
normally do in life. So people will be uh, making probably musical in instruments, giving performances, doing paintings, arts, crafts, dance, uh, preparing garments. Uh, those are regular work, uh, preparing food and, you know, so many things. So there is a lot of work uh, for everyone there. And those people who think their work is done, you know, they could leave and go to some other place. And we have got those, you know, transition uh, uh, systems also. We are working out of how the monies and all that can be transferred and how they can get uh, value when they leave. Thank you, Daryl. Um, we, uh, we have a question from Teresa. She says, there is someone and a village that practices barter system. Would you like to interact with him on how he's handling it? Yes, yes, surely. Uh, surely, please uh, let me know about it. I am just going to um, uh, put my email in the chat and definitely you can send me, you know, uh, uh, that person's contact. Or if you know me, definitely, of course, you can, uh, uh, you know, directly let me know about it. But in case, Pisa, you're somebody that uh, I have not uh, interacted with earlier, here is my email ID in the chat box. Mail Daryl at gmail.com. Yeah, I'm looking forward to people who are into natural currency and barter because even we want to perfect the system that we are, what we are putting in the eco village. So it'll be really uh, wonderful to uh, interact with the person. So we're out of questions. Uh, we've come to the end of today's session. A big thank you to Daryl for opening a new world view that gives us hope towards a healthy future for all and Mother Earth. Um, thank you to the audience as well for being curious enough to, being, uh, for, to be with us today. Um, we hope this session was an informative one for you. And we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow at the same time on the same link for our day 18 topic, Healthy Community Markets. So namaste and have a lovely evening. Namaste. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Sophie. And uh, thank you, uh, Chandra Vikas ji. Uh, good night and God bless.